Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. I have a very special message to relate to you, to beckon in the new year of 2015. Today on the show we're going to be talking about war and peace and torture, and uh, especially given the new revelations about the U.S. torture practices of the CIA and U.S. government uh, being released in that document by the U.N. Uh, so I'm going to be reading to you from a book called Why Peace? Um, it was edited by a good friend of mine, uh, Mark Gutman. I had him on the show a while back to discuss his other book, Why Liberty? And uh, I do plan on having him on the show to discuss this book as well in this coming year. Uh, I chose this message as the last broadcast of 2014 for my radio show because war is uh, so prominent on my mind as one of the most destructive forces on earth. The mass murder of innocents, the destruction of infrastructure, the uh, killing of many, many people, not only directly through weapons and bombs and all of that stuff, but also indirectly through the destruction of uh, sanitation plants and, and electrical grids and stuff like that. It's just such a travesty on mankind. So I hope that this message will resonate with you as well. This article is by Jamshid Marvasti, and uh, he's a medical doctor. He's a child and adult psychiatrist who has practiced for more than 30 years in the U.S. He's a specialist on psychological trauma, terrorism, and child maltreatment. And uh, he's particularly qualified, I believe, to speak on things like war and trauma and all of that stuff. He says, if I wanted to live in a country where the government cheats, deceives, tortures, brainwashes, and violates human rights, I would have stayed in the Middle East. Introduction. I am an American by choice rather than by birth. In this writing, when I refer to the U.S. or America, I use these to refer to the United States government and not the citizens of the United States. Likewise, terms such as we do not refer to you and me personally, but rather to the administration. I have respect and admiration for American citizens. In fact, I married one. And I presently consider most Americans to be victims, exploited, deceived, and brainwashed by major news media and the government, which in my opinion are both greatly controlled by the same elite group. Before entering the U.S., the dream of Camelot. Quote, we are to be that shining city upon a hill, President Ronald Reagan. I was born into a military family in Iran and grew up in an educated middle-class home. My mother, a midwife, worked day and night, but more so at night because, as she used to say, quote, babies come at midnight. My father was a major in the Iranian army when I was born, and eventually he became a general. I remember the summer of 1953 when the CIA carried out their coup in Iran. The coup resulted in the overthrow of the democratically elected nationalist Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh and the installation of Mohammad Reza Shah Palafi's dictatorship. I was only a child, but I remember watching my father, then a colonel, as he stayed up all night listening to the radio and smoking cigarettes. Once in a while, I would hear the name of my father's friend on the broadcast. I did not understand as a child on that night how significantly the destiny of my country had changed. This coup became a thorn in the sides of many Iranian nationalists. They felt resentment toward the U.S. government, whose leaders seemed to think they were in a position to know what was best for Iranians, as if Iranians did not know how to take care of themselves. I, however, was able to rationalize this incident and felt maybe the American CIA agents knew something that we Iranians did not. Perhaps they had information that ordinary people were not privy to concerning the plans of the Soviet Union. The Soviets were pushing for a regime change in Iran through their Communist Party, Tudeh. At the time, we received constant propaganda from the Soviet Union. They were critical of America and thought of Americans as victims and slaves of capitalism. I did not believe this until I began to practice medicine in the United States and found that the political system here and its interventions were forcing some of my elderly patients to choose between their medication and their food. In fact, according to the government's own data, their policies are making the rich richer and the poor poorer. Eventually, I passed the medical exam necessary for entering residency training in the United States. 
My father encouraged me to go to the West for my education, and my mother would always add, learn science and bring it back. In some ways, the U.S. did look a lot like Camelot, a center of art, science, and freedom. At that time, Iran was a police state, with corrupt government officials and a notorious security service, Savak, which brutally tortured many opponents of the government. Savak had been created under the guidance of the CIA and the Israeli intelligence agency, the Mossad, in the 1950s. According to Jesse J. Leaf, a former CIA analyst in Iran, Savak was instructed in torture techniques by CIA agents. In fact, after the 1979 revolution, Iranians found a CIA film made for Savak on, quote, how to torture women. The country was run by a Suedo political party under the Shah, and all of the news was censored and controlled by the Shah's government. There was no arbiter of justice to whom anyone could complain about Savak and the police. Any demonstration at my university, no matter how peaceful, would end with police invading the area, beating up students and arresting them. Several of my classmates were arrested and tortured. As a medical student in Iran, I worked with one hospital physician who had graduated from a school in the U.S. After returning to Iran, he was arrest arrested, tortured, and sentenced to years in jail for his opposition to the Shah. This was a time when people were executed because of their leftist, communist ideologies. At that time, Iran was a country in which a Shakespearean play could not be shown because of its content. The regime believed that if an emperor such as Julius Caesar could be assassinated, it might give Iranians the idea that their own king could also be killed. The beginning of my disappointment, disillusion. Quote, if I sit silently, I have sinned. Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh. In 1973, I came to the U.S. leaving behind the dictatorship of the Shah of Iran. Even though the Shah's dictatorship was fully supported by the U.S., I still had positive feelings toward the U.S. system of government. By comparison, the neighboring citizens of the USSR had less freedom to speak or travel, and less certainty that their leaders would re respect their human rights. While in Iran, I also learned that even in anti-communist America, members of the Communist Party had the freedom to believe in their own ideals and to even vote for their own presidential candidates. In school, I had learned Lincoln's famous quotation about a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I found this deeply moving and wanted to learn more about the U.S. system of government. I was always fascinated with the idea of freedom, especially freedom of speech and news media. Gradually, I started to adjust to American life in the 1970s and continued to have positive feelings toward the U.S. government. Here, there were Iranian students who openly opposed the Shah and were even able to write about it. In political terms, they ranged from left communist Marxist Maoist to right-wing religious believers. I began to meet them to read their anti-Shah literature published by the Iranian opposition in the United States. This writing also criticized the U.S. government as the greatest supporter of the Shah, and it was exciting for me to see that the government here did not censor these newspapers or prevent their publication. How different from the way things were in Iran at that time, where every newspaper, every bit of written material, and had to be first cleared for publication by Savak. During the 70s, I did not have any major complaints about the U.S. system, although by then I had started to read material by Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky. While I felt that they might be right some of the time, I generally didn't fully believe in their analysis of and allegations against the U.S. government. I was in denial. Looking back, I see that this denial was necessary for me at the time. In the field of psychiatry, we call this denial in service of ego. I compared myself to one of my patients from long ago, a woman whose husband had been carrying on multiple affairs. There was ample indication of his infidelity, but because it was too painful for her to believe or accept it, she remained in denial. This was similar to my relationship with the U.S. government. It happened gradually, but over time my denial decreased and bitter reality began to take a more prominent place. Eye-opening experiences began to bring forth undeniable truths about the U.S. government. For example, it was only after the 1979 revolution in Iran that we learned some of the secrets of the Shah's dictatorship. Revelations of wrongdoing came from the Iranian people, not the government of the revolution. During a visit to Iran after the revolution, I spoke with people who filled me in on what had happened with regards to human rights violations by Shah. 
The most shocking allegations involved American CIA agents who had taught various torture techniques to members of SAVAK and had even to sold them high-tech torture machines. It seemed the Iranians were in the habit of torturing the opposition to the point that they became unconscious or died. The U.S. agents set out to teach them the nuances of torture, explaining that the goal is to inflict maximum pain, but cause only a minimum amount of loss of consciousness, permanent bodily injury, or death. They explained that the purpose of torture is to break the detainees' will, to control them, get a confession, and gain the names of their friends and collaborators. This baffled me. I could not understand how the same government that was supposed to protect individual rights to due process could teach torture. Elements of my disillusion My disillusion did not develop overnight. I was full of disdain when I heard that Chomsky believed the U.S. was a, quote, leading terrorist state. He referred to the U.S. Army's guideline on low-intensity warfare, comparing these practices with terrorism. Slowly and over time, I began to recognize that he may be at least partially right. Terrorism has generally been referred to as a technique of the weak. However, Chomsky explained that Western regimes also commit terrorism, but they refer to it as, quote, counterterrorism. 1. The similarity between terrorism and counterterrorism. Quote, you will never end terrorism by terrorizing others, Martin Luther King Jr., Quote, terrorism is the war of the poor, and war is the terrorism of the rich. Sir Peter Ustinov One of my first disappointments was over the Reagan administration's monetary and military support for the armed Contras, who engaged in terrorism against the legitimately elected Satanista government of Nicaragua. Next was the U.S. support for the apartheid government of South Africa, which was also operating as a terrorist government and providing support for white rule in South Africa through military, intelligence, nuclear, and economic cooperation. The apartheid regime was terrorizing blacks and those who supported them. Such policies bothered me, and I began to wonder how terrorism was actually different from counterterrorism. Both Reagan and George W. Bush have claimed that other countries hate us because we represent freedom and democracy. This assertion was, by then, no longer believable for me. I had come to realize that the United States had long supported, and continues to support, some of the world's most brutal dictators. It is only logical that the citizens of the corrupt foreign governments that we support will resent us. Former U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Robert Bowman made a keen observation about the U.S. role in other countries. He had flown many bombing missions in Vietnam before becoming a Catholic priest, then an archbishop. He said, We are not hated because we practice democracy, value freedom, or uphold human rights. We are hated because our government denies these things to people in third world countries whose resources are coveted by our multinational corporations. I was dismayed to realize that the Western governments ignored or downplayed their own behavior in contributing to the creation of opposition and terrorism in other countries. This was especially true after 9-11. I thought of the proverb made popular by Hillary Clinton, quote, it takes a village to raise a child. We could also say it takes two villages to raise a terrorist. The American government had become one of those villages. Our village contributes to the development of terrorism by invading, occupying, and colonizing the other village's land and resources, and by humiliating its citizens. Western counterterrorism operations tend to rely solely on killing the suspected terrorist, while disregarding the fact that many innocent civilians are also killed in the process. One example was an incident in which coalition forces bombed a house in a Pakistani village based on information that a suspected terrorist might be inside. In this case, they also knew, knew that the house contained women, children, and other civilians. That, however, did not deter them from bombing. The local villagers later denied that the home had been harboring a terrorist and were left to mourn for the loss of the dozen civilians inside the home who had effectively been sentenced to death despite their innocence. No Western authority questions the morality of such massacres, not the major corporate media, nor the legislators who fund these killings with taxpayers' wealth. The perpetrators, from the president to the drone operators in Nevada, will not have to face a war crimes tribunal.
There are two sets of rules at work here. On our own soil, police and law enforcement officials are instructed that, whenever possible, they are not to shoot an offender if he or she is holding a hostage, because the hostage may get hurt. In fact, law enforcement officials are trained not to shoot at any time when civilians are present due to risk of civilian injury. Yet overseas, we knowingly bomb innocent civilian areas with impunity. 2. Double Standard Quote, when fascism comes to America, it will be wrapped in the flag, carrying a cross. Sinclair Lewis I have also been increasingly bothered by the double standard that is such an obvious part of U.S. policy. For example, when President Reagan was asked why the Nicaraguan Contras were not being called terrorists, despite the fact that they employed all the tactics associated with terrorism, he replied that the Contras were, quote, freedom fighters. This justified his willingness to support them, as they were, went on destroying farms, killing civilians, and engaging in illegal arms and cocaine trafficking. More recently, Libya has been criticized by U.S. leaders and the media for using cluster bombs in civilian areas, which is a violation of international legal conventions against the use of such weapons. These munitions explode into hundreds of bomblets, which, if left unexploded, can remain in the landscape where they can harm civilians for decades. Yet, the U.S. considered it okay to use cluster bombs in Iraq and Afghanistan. In March of 2011, U.S. forces began using B-2 stealth bombers to target sites in Libya. They carry 2,000-pound bombs, including the massive bunker buster. Members of the Libyan opposition complained bitterly about the impact of these airstrikes on civilians and members of the resistance. Yet in France, Foreign Mil Minister Elaine Juppé defended the U.S. and NATO by saying Qaddafi's forces were the problem since they were located in heavily populated civilian areas. On May 16th, Britain's top military commander proposed that NATO begin widening their air campaign to include electrical power grids and fuel dumps in government-held regions. In late 2011, the International Criminal Court started to investigate the allegation of war crimes which were committed by NATO in Libya. To the average person, our leaders may seem preoccupied with exporting democratic elections and government to other countries. However, this concept of democracy is very much distorted. The U.S. government encourages dem democratic elections in third world countries, as long as the citizens of those countries choose the candidate that the U.S. likes. If they do not, they may be punished through economic sanctions or even a plot of regime change. 3. News Media Lies, Distortion, and Disinformation Many of us remember the infamous video footage of the Kuwaiti nurse who, that was released immediately prior to the first Gulf War. The sobbing woman recounted how Iraqi soldiers had stormed the hospital in Kuwait. They reportedly removed babies from their incubators, throwing them to the floor so they could steal the incubators and send them to Iraq. The video was circulated as part of a plea to save the Kuwaiti people from the evil atrocities of Saddam Hussein. After several months, human rights organizations learned that the woman had been an actress, and the video was allegedly the product of a Washington, D.C. public relations firm. For me, this kind of propaganda was an unforgivable sin. Later, after 9-11, I found it unsettling when Vice President Dick Cheney adamantly claimed that there was a connection between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. From a historical point of view, of course, the two men were enemies. The president and the CIA, under pressure from reporters, denied that there were any connection. Even so, the major corporate news media failed to demand that Cheney disclose the source of his information. This was a deceptive exploitation of 9-11 used to justify the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq. I can't help but recall Susan Sarandon's question, quote, before our kids start coming home from Iraq in body bags and women and children start dying in Baghdad, I need to know, what did Iraq do to us? Unfortunately, the news media does not seem to be getting better at reporting the truth. In early 2011, the Hartford Current ran the headline, Egypt is free, on the day Mubarak resigned. Ironically, during the more than 30 years that Egypt was not free, the current never ran a story about their lack of freedom. Mubarak visited the U.S. multiple times and was even welcome in the White House without criticism. Another discrepancy in U.S. policy was evident in our backing of protesters in Libya. We supported these citizens in praise of democracy and yet somehow ignored their contemporaries in Bahrain, Yemen, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. The governments of these four countries, although dictatorial and brutal, remain our allies. 4. War, Occupation, and Deception 
Quote, I just want you to know that when we talk about war, we're really talking about peace. George W. Bush. After more than 30 years of life in America, I find it disheartening that war is so often the first choice for the U.S. government and not the last. We forget that the Bible, which teaches us that he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Recall President George W. Bush's preemptive strike as he sought military action in Iraq. Over time, I have come to realize that the hasty invasion of Iraq indicates the extent of just how influential the war industry is. Is this what Eisenhower feared when he expressed concern that the U.S. would become a military-industrial complex? I remember finding it odd when President Clinton chose Senator William Cohen, a Republican from Maine, to become his Secretary of Defense. Years later, President Obama made a similar move by picking Robert Gates, a well-known Republican, to be his Secretary of Defense. It seems to me that their choices had little to do with the actual platforms of either the Republican or Democratic parties. What messages are these two presidents giving us with their selections? That war is our business, and business should be as usual, regardless of who is in the White House. Also, by choosing Republicans for their secretaries of defense, these two Democrats were effectively absolving their own party from criticism. They were telling the other party that in no way they should criticize the war, because to do so would be to criticize our own men. 5. Our best friends are among the worst brutal dictators and torturers. It saddens me to know that the U.S. government has supported some of the most brutal authoritarian regimes, such as that of General Augustus Pinochet and those of the South America, Africa during apartheid, Haiti, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, where Christians are not allowed to have churches and women cannot have driver's licenses, and at times Saddam Hussein. To give an example, I will discuss the case of General Dostum, a top commander who is on our side in the Afghani government. American television news spent considerable resources focusing on his activities, which reportedly included such brutalities as skinning his enemies alive. Later, it was announced that the American-backed government had chosen him to be a deputy defense minister for Karzai. Thus, a torturer became a U.S. favorite. The major U.S. news media abruptly stopped reporting on any negative aspects of this brutal general. We must remember that the entire fiasco in Afghanistan began with the U.S. support for the Mujahideen in that country, which became the Taliban. Taliban is plural for students of the clergy. The, these were the root organizations for Osama bin Laden's militants who were fighting a progressive, secular Afghani government. The only problem with this government, as far as the U.S. was concerned, was their affiliation with the Soviet Union. The July 2010 cover of Time magazine featured a photo of an Afghani woman whose nose and lips had been cut off by the order of a Taliban commander. The directive was carried out by her husband and brother-in-law after she reportedly fled from abusive in-laws. There is no doubt that this story is a tragedy and represents the fates of many women who are forced to live under the Taliban's law. What we are quick to forget, however, is the U.S. involvement in bringing the Taliban to power by offering them money, arms, and political support from American taxpayers. It seems that the U.S. government has no problem with brutality as long as it suits its own interests. The message that the foreign policy of the U.S. gives us is, if you side with us, you can get away with murder. Could we request our democratic government to disclose the name of the U.S. politicians or agents who supported the Taliban and bin Laden? Are they still in decision-making positions? 6. Torture For me, Abu Ghraib was the straw that broke the camel's back. In this case, the camel's back was the reputation of the United States as that shining city upon a hill. Seeing the now infamous image of a man with a hood over his face and his arms extended, who could help but think of Jesus on the cross? Even more troubling to me was the lying, cheating, and distortion by government officials who told us that this was the work of a few low-ranking bad apples. One of these pictures showed a sophisticated type of torture used by the Brazilian army. I asked myself how a few low-ranking bad apples could know such techniques. Months later, it was discovered that the authorization for torture had come from Washington. Before the invasion of Iraq, President Bush and Vice President Cheney had promised that once Saddam Hussein was overthrown, that there would be no more torture chambers in Iraq. However, Abu Ghraib is evidence of the futility of this promise. Dr. Hamid Dabasha, a 
an, an Iranian scholar and professor at Columbia University, reported that there was an attempt to justify the human rights violations of Abu Ghraib due to the demands of counterterrorism policies. Yet, he explains, quote, The eventual revelations about the United States torture chambers at Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan, Abu Ghraib in Iraq, and Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, and throughout an entire network of interrogation dungeons in Europe, plus discoveries of sporadic war crimes, rape, murder, and massacre of civilians in Fallujah, Haditha, and Mudamida in Iraq, have entirely discredited the United States as an arbitrator of human rights abuses. Dr. Debashi is also referred to Western writers and politicians who, quote, theorize the legal and moral necessity of torturing people to support these policies. I remember when the Hartford Current published a front-page story about a factory in the nearby town of Bloomfield, Connecticut. This company, operating with the permission of U.S. authorities, was making torture devices and selling them to foreign governments. According to Amnesty International, there are no fewer than six U.S. companies selling equipment used for torture. China, in comparison, lists half that many. There is a saying that, to the man who only has a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Likewise, those who develop machines and technology for torture seek out human targets and soon see them everywhere. Other reliable journals have reported about the School of America's in Fort Benning, Georgia, a military school that has been teaching torture for foreign students for years, according to author Stephen Ledman. This practice of rendition or kidnapping a foreign citizen and secretly transporting him or her to another country for torture is extremely disturbing to me. An example is the 26 CIA agents who allegedly kidnapped an Italian clergyman and took him to Egypt to be tortured and interrogated before ultimately establishing his innocence. My great disappointment in President Obama is that, contrary to his pre-election promise, he has decided against prosecuting American agents involved in torture, explaining that they would not be prosecuted because they were under orders. This excuse did not work in the Nuremberg court that America helped set up, and it should not work now. He also defended and continued the practice of rendition, whereby we allow our other governments to torture prisoners on our behalf. When the security of a country is based on the practice of torture of prisoners, that country creates more enemies than friends. A government that trains its young men and women to torture detainees for the sake of national security is also securing sadism and savagery in its nation. This is one thing that the enemy cannot do to us. We can only do it to ourselves. Carl Menninger stated that, quote, love not only cures the one who receives it, but also the one who gives it. I say, torture not only destroys the one who receives it, but also the one who gives it. The Last Hope, American Citizens Do I miss my dream of Camelot? Yes, I do, and I still pursue it even despite negative elements that continue to surround us. When not fed misinformation by the mainstream news media, Americans draw important conclusions from the information to which they gain access. Once the truth becomes clear, we can make distinctions between American citizens as a society and the U.S. government. For example, it eventually came to light that Khaled El Masri, a German citizen, was kidnapped by the U.S. government from Germany and taken to a secret prison in Afghanistan where he was tortured. He was held without counsel for five months until they determined he was innocent and had no ties with terrorism. He then traveled to the U.S. and Germany and brought a suit against the CIA over their involvement with his abduction. While on a visit to the U.S., he said, quote, I will never forget an elderly couple in Richmond, Virginia, who came to support my case against the government holding signs that read, Stop the torture flights. That is the real face of the United States. The people who kidnapped me represent the hidden and false face of America. Sometimes an American, usually right-wing and very patriotic, will criticize me and ask me why I choose to remain in this country when I don't like what our government is doing here. I answer by paraphrasing a former president who said, quote, There is nothing wrong with America that can't be corrected by what is right with America. And so I am here to correct and to support what is right in America. That article is by Jamshid Marvasti. He's an Iranian uh, citizen who came over here and became an American citizen. And so I think he has a very unique perspective on the war machine that is the U.S. state. So I hope that you enjoyed this. This was again from the book by Mark Gutman called Why Peace. And I hope that you can tune in next week for another episode of the Austrian Circle. Have a great week. Take care.